friends. Nice and light encouraging <laughs> <laughs> reading just to get us in the mood for tonight. Anyway, welcome. My name's Matt. It's, uh, it's good to be here. And sometimes when I preach, I've got a message and I'm really excited about it. Like last time I spoke on three hours, I was like really excited. And I'm excited to preach tonight, but it's a, it's a harder message. It's not like one we're going, oh, that was really lovely and encouraging. This one's a, it's a harder, weightier message for us, but it's God's message to us, not my message to us. And the concept is, which we're just really briefly going to look at, and it's linked to prayer, but it's not just about prayer, is the simple thing that God reigns, that God rules, that he has a kingdom, and that he is the boss of it. You can see it up there. We say it in the Lord's Prayer. And I'll even say this now. We say, your kingdom come, your will be done. So your kingdom in heaven, your rule and your reign, wherever that is at the moment, come and be stronger and be bigger and rule on earth because we know it's not completely ruling on earth now as it is in heaven. We pray that every week. We, you may pray that every morning. I know Reese used to pray that with Alexa every morning, jumping into the water. You still do that? I said early in polar water. They used to pray the Lord's Prayer every morning, and they pray this, that God would would come. Those lines there, some people say those words in a spirit of resignation. It's like, oh, your will, not mine. I'm giving up. But really, there's so much power in these words. It's actually a proactive stance of God's people under his reign fighting for his kingdom on earth right now, of his reign and everything that tastes of that reign to be lived out and expressed in our Bondi community, in our families and wherever we go in life. God reigns. Maybe in your life you've had great moments and I'm sure we all have things which are just high, like great moments of just beauty. Maybe you've travelled and you've seen just beautiful things and it's just been like special. You probably remember them right now. Maybe you've had beautiful moments of just friendship and family. Those moments which are just like that special meal, which is just beautifully intimate and warm and abundant. Maybe you've had moments of just beauty, maybe through music or performance or art, which just seem to elevate to a new level, a higher level. Maybe you've had deep spiritual experiences which are truly satisfied in that little moment. There are so many beautiful things in life. But for many of us, and maybe for you this week, and maybe for you for your entire life, there are many things which are just not as rosy and as high and as great. Maybe there's plenty of life which is pretty grey and mundane. Or maybe there's a bit of life which is actually quite dark and painful and hard. And probably if we all share honestly, there's a lot of life which is like that. You just turn on the news and I hate watching it now because it's just so negative and so dark. Last night I woke up, I'm not sure of the thing, but I woke up at 2 a.m. because there were loud noises. And I quickly checked on um, social media in the morning and there were gunshots. It's like in North London. Freak you all out. But it was just like, okay. I thought about fireworks because it's normally fireworks, but no, this time it was gunshots. We live in a world where there's war. And we remember Anzac Day this weekend of pointless, not pointless, lots of wasted life. Disease, some of you are carrying sickness, whether they're physical or mental. <coughs> Life that doesn't seem to be as it's meant to be. Tyranny, violence, power, abuse, poverty, death, injustice, famine. Life can be pretty dark. I sit with my grandma, and she's 98, 99. She's lived a great life, but watching her slowly disappear, I'm frailer and frailer, but her mind sort of going that she doesn't really know who I am anymore. And I'm left with, is this really the way it's meant to be? The dignity of her life is sort of going. And even the way she's treated by staff who are paid to look after her isn't always the best. Is this God's reign and is this God's rule? And if God is ruling, is this how he wants to rule? I was talking on Thursday night. I went out and just had some drinks with some dads in the area. And one guy, halfway through your conversation, it was typical guys at the pub talking about nothing, trying to tell better stories than the person next to him, spiraling up. And then he just started crying halfway through one of them, some dad story. And we're like, oh, what's in the end of these? He's like, oh, my, my, best, my best mate just died. 
and he was a 42 year old guy died from cancer all pretty quick and now his wife hasn't got a husband and his children don't have a dad and he was literally just like why this is happening so we ordered another round of beers we, we chatted i remember sitting in africa and i've been there several times and it's a, got a special place in my heart i'd love to go back there one day and i was just sitting with orphans and I knew a little bit of their story because someone had fed me in and I knew nearly every single orphan. I had six of them in my arm. It was a special moment. Got a photo. I looked very white, by the way, in that photo. Got a little black orphan. But in that moment, I knew each of those orphans were there, not of their own accord, but largely from an injustice that someone else or an evil had done to us. Whether it was government corruption, whether it was personal crimes to the family, that each one of them there were a victim of other people's evil, and you're left with God, are you reigning and is this your kingdom? And we could continue on, and we can even look at the church. God reigns and he rules his church. How come so much of it is persecuted and destroyed? Like we'll hear next week. Or we can look at it even here and go, if you reign God, why is your church seem so small and contaminated and broken and corrupted? And it's meant to be your safe people that you're present. We can be left with those same questions that were in that Psalm, Psalm 10. And I love Psalm 10 because it's faith, it's real. Sometimes we may be scared to pray those prayers. And it starts off, I'll read them again. Why do you stand far off? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? God's people calling out to the God who reigns, going, basically, where are you? In verse 12, it goes, arise, Lord, in faith. It's like, wake up, God. Lift up your hand and act. If you are the king, and this is your kingdom, and your reign and rule is on earth right now, what is going on? We're left with attention. We're left with a belief that so many of us will hold on to and spit out of our mouths quite boldly that God reigns. And we're left with a heart and an experience which challenges that all the time. One of the most central beliefs that I think we as a church hold, and maybe you hold in your own, <coughs> is that God is a creator and that God has rescued his creation in the story that we have just celebrated with Easter, that God has died and risen again to rescue his creation, his people. Colossians 1, 15 to 20, which we haven't had read out, paints this picture of a God who reigns, but it's a significant reign. It's a reign, not just of a little sphere over here. Like some kings, they reign on a certain geographical region. This passage paints the size of his reign, and we find that God reigns above all of creation, above things that are seen and unseen. So not just the physical, tangible things, but all the invisible powers and spiritual things that are going on. Among all the powers and authorities and thrones, he reigns above the church. He reigns above the living and the dead. He reigns over all things. It's a picture of cosmic reigning. He's reigning over all things. His reign is way bigger than our little hearts. Sometimes we reduce God's reign just down to me and Jesus in my heart. But his reign is over Wanda, his reign is over Australia, his reign is over the entire cosmos and every planet and every star and every thing in that ever expanding universe. It's saying here that God has reconciled all of this. It was an entity, it was broken by the fall which we believe in. And the good news is that God has reconciled all of it. He's reconciled humanity through the death of Jesus on the cross. He's reconciled creation that it will not grumble anymore. He's reconciled the stars and the cosmic power through his death on the cross, through his blood being shed to pay the price for the brokenness that humanity brought into this world. The victory has been won, we celebrated with this. Sin has been defeated. Death has been defeated. Shame has been eradicated. And God is now seated on the throne. I'm often left with that question. People are always going, what's Jesus doing now? He died on the cross 2,000 years ago, but what's he doing now? He is seated on the throne, ruling and reigning. Seated because the work is finished. He's not fighting anymore. The work is done. He is seated and ruling and reigning 
but he's our problem, isn't he? The victory is won, but it's not complete. Some put it, it is now, like he reigns now, but the experience of it is not completely yet. It is guaranteed, but it's not fully received. We've got a down payment, but not the whole thing. We have a first fruit, but not all of the fruits. And to me, this makes sense of our experience. We have an earth, which technically has been reconciled to God and it's all good, but it's still a good shaking. There are still problems with our creation, but we know that it will be made brand new. We're still faced by death and disease and famine. It's been defeated but it hasn't been abolished. We taste brokenness in human relationships still every day, probably through nearly every conversation we have. And we have this deep longing for more. We have a deep longing for God's kingdom to reign. And when I say God's kingdom, we have a deep longing for justice to reign because we have a just God. We long for justice to be the air that we breathe each day that we turn on the news and see stories of justice and equality. We have a yearning for beauty in all things, in music and in art. We long for a day when truly beautiful things are celebrated and honoured and cherished. We have an eagerness for true fellowship, of deep connection, of safe community that is encouraging and brings out the best, where all are welcome no matter who we are. And we have a true longing for deep, true spirituality that deeply satisfies, that deeply answers questions and deeply lives out what it is meant to be. The good news that scripture paints is that God has won the victory for all those things. It is reign to be present on earth now, but we also hold on to scripture that there is a day where that will be fully tasted and revealed right here on earth. The death will not just be defeated, it will be abolished. The sin will not just be forgiven, but it will be no more. The creation will be made brand new and be ever more glorious. The shame will be no more and replaced with freedom. There are a few of us just praying on Friday morning in there, and we prayed about shame, and we just had a sense of the amount of shame that people carry in their lives, Christians and non-Christians. Imagine a life where shame is eradicated. The things are, are a burden, or you want to hide, Jesus has paid for them to enable the freedom that we sort of hold on to. We will hold on one day, we will live in a renewed, perfect creation where shame is gone, where we can be who we truly are in Christ. And chaos will be absent. From Revelation, I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death, or mourning, or crying, or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. I'm not going to get into pragmatics of when, or how, and the mechanics of how all this thing, because that's not the intention of this passage. The intention of this passage is to say that God's rule is big. God's rule has won and he's seated on the throne. And there is a day coming where it will be fully experienced and revealed on this earth. And so we live in anticipation of this. We live in anticipation that one day this earth will not be groaning. And when I say no groaning, there will be no climate change. There will be no excessive waste. There will be no destruction of the land. There will be no natural disasters. The creation will be in harmony because God has reconciled it to himself. There will be a place where justice will rule, where there will be no need for marches like Black Lives Matter or Me Too movements or unions to uh, protect rights or agencies that are fighting for equality in third world countries where people are taken advantage of because justice will reign. So much of what people are longing for in this world is actually achieved through the death and resurrection of Jesus. We just haven't tasted it fully yet. Where full beauty will be revealed, where fellowship will be complete and everyone will feel safe and be known and have a home. And where worship will be complete. 
completely, truly satisfied with God will be our God and we will be his people. This is not a utopian future. This is not like a, um, or maybe even a dystopian future. This is the next step in God's plan. It's the next chapter in the book and we are waiting for it right now. It's not the next chapter, it's the final chapter. And so we find ourselves in this weird little gap, don't we? Where God reigns and it's all been one and he's seated. But we're in the flows of that being fully revealed and tasted and enjoyed. And that's been going on for 2,000 years. But God is still reigning and ruling. And so what does it quickly mean to us? It means so much. And I can have endless points here. But the first thing I want to pass on to us, it definitely means for us that in the meantime, while we wait, while we look for the hope and trust and we wait for that day, that we are to be faithful to that people. If God reigns and rules, if we are Christian, we are under his king, and that is our true home, living life for him. As it says in Matthew, that we have to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And so we are to be faithful in terms of who he is, and what he's asked us to do. But we're also to be faithful in terms of what is that kingdom about. And so to be a Christian, we should be about justice because our God is just. To be a Christian, we should be living lives of beauty because God is a God of beautifully good things. We should be living in a community that is connected, deep and safe and beautiful. And we should be stepping in to enjoy our creator through worship and community together. Be faithful. So many of us just sort of step in a little bit and have another foot in the other kingdom as well. The invitation for us while we wait is to remember who we are as his people. But as Martin also said last week, Jesus sends his church. He sends his church to be a witness to who the king is and to live out his kingdom. Sadly, I mean, I've met so many Christians who they describe their Christian life as I'm saved and I'm just waiting to go to heaven and that's about it. They're literally on pause and they're living very insignificant lives. They're living very boring lives and I say that probably with judgment. But they've got no concept of that God has sent them to live out his kingdom now. His <laughs> kingdom come on your kingdom come your will be done on earth as it is some people grasp that and they don't live a life of passive resignation they live a life of action of living out the kingdom of worship to him and love of faith and for me one of the wake up calls I've had this week as I've sat with this concept is if you're a Christian in this room, God's given all of you, I guess you the categorize in those happy categories. He's given you time, he's given you talents, and he's given you resources, treasure. And 1 Corinthians 3, verse 15, you're going to look into it, alludes to the fact that God is on that day when he comes back, he's going to ask us how we went using our time as his people. Not judging us for heaven but judging us with how we were steward of the things that I gave you. He has sent us. We are in his kingdom. And he's going to ask, how did you go with that? And some things are going to be burnt up, as it talks about in 1 Corinthians 3, and some things are going to last and will carry in to the new heavens and the new earth. And so I ask myself, and I ask you, if you are a Christian, are you making the most of what God has given you to live out his kingdom on earth? There are so many people who don't know the king. There are so many people who are in need. And there is justice needs everywhere. And there are faith needs everywhere. Are you willing to be used? And to be a bit like Reese, like, here I am, Lord, send me. I'm, I'm ready. I'm willing to go. And it doesn't mean jumping on a plane for everyone. Most of us are probably just means going on what we're doing tomorrow, but embracing the fact that God has equipped me for something. If you don't know Christ, 
I encourage you what this means is be known by Christ. John 5, 24 says this, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be judged but has crossed over from death to life. In Jesus' death on the cross, his blood was shed that we can be reconciled to him. We have passed from our broken state to be found perfect in him because of what he wrote. So we can go with him into the renewed creation. The creator has got no intention of bringing the brokenness into the new creation. And if you don't know Christ, it just simply says here, whoever hears my words and believes, he will make new and he will pass from death to life. So I encourage you to be known to know Christ, to say yes to him, to say forgive me, to say I want to follow you. I want to be sent and live with purpose to fight for justice and to live out his kingdom on earth. And the last one is to be ready. If you're like me, I get up most days and just keep going like I think. I've got life. I think I'm going to live to a certain age. I've got plans. I'll do this here. I'll do that there. But the hard reality, which I forget every day, and I'm reminded again myself, is that we need to be ready because Jesus is actually coming back. And we don't know when. Matthew 24, I'll read it again, verses 42. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. But understand this. If the owner of the house had known at what time of night the thief is coming, he would have kept watch and would not have let his house be broken into. So you also must be ready, because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. Our God reigns. Our God rules, and he has won the victory in the cross. And we as a church have been sent out to live life in that reign and rule. But Jesus is coming back. And there will be a time where justice will reign, where every tear will be wiped away, that the things that you're battling and carrying right now in this fallen world will be gone. Will be gone. Think of the things that you might have been carrying in the last year. I, don't, I know a few of the stories in the train, but I know there is grief and I know there is pain because of the brokenness that we have in this world. There will be a day where Jesus renews them, heals them, and there will be no and there will be a day that our creation will be at peace as well. And that we will live with God. And God will be our God and we will be his people. And so be known by him. Be ready. Make the most of the skills and time that we've got. Because we don't know when he's going to come. Maybe tomorrow. Maybe in another 2,000 years. But let's hold on in faith and trust. Let me pray. <coughs> I just want to declare that you do reign, Father, that you are the sovereign king. I thank you that you haven't left us in this broken state of ourselves and the creation, but you sent yourself to die on the cross to reconcile it to you, to heal it, to fix it. And we thank you that you defeated the evil one. We thank you that you defeated death. And we thank you that you defeated the curse and broke the curse. And Jesus, help us and empower us by your Holy Spirit to be your people, to use what you've given us well, to fight for your kingdom on earth as it is in heaven, and help us to be ready for when you come back, that we may hear your voice clearly. Well done, good and faithful sir. And Father, we long for the day where we will be in that perfect state with you, where there will be no more pain. And we simply say together, come, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen.